thank you all so much for coming. Um, we're glad you could uh, come as tonight we discuss how the Arab Spring has given Arab women new ways to participate in public life and reinvigorated discussion of the ways that a feminist agenda can be reconciled with Islam. And there's considerable difference of opinion among our panelists as to whether the Arab Spring will ultimately turn out to have been a good thing or a bad thing for Arab women. Um, we'll be opening up to questions actually about halfway through this time, um, and so I hope you'll all join in with your thoughts as well. Um, um, furthest away from me is, is Mona El Tahawi. Uh, Mona is an Egyptian American freelance journalist and columnist. She began her career as a news reporter in the Middle East, and she was the first Egyptian journalist to live in Israel while reporting for a Western news agency. Um, Mona um, sadly recently uh, had her left arm and her right hand broken by Egyptian security forces in Tahrir Square and she's been back in New York uh, recuperating before she goes back to uh, Egypt next week, I think. Um, in the middle um, is Isabel Coleman. Um, Isabel is the director of the Civil Society Markets and Democracy Initiative at the Council on Foreign Relations. She's also the author of Paradise Beneath Her Feet, How Women Are Transforming the Middle East, um, which examines the ways in which Muslim activists are fighting the portrayal of women's empowerment as an imperialist import by fighting for women's rights within Islam instead of against it. And the book uh, will be available for sale after the panel, and I um, really can't recommend it highly enough. Um, next to me is Ebtihal Mubarak. Ebtihal is a Saudi journalist and blogger who focuses on human rights and women's issues. Uh, when I first met Ebtihal in Jeddah in 2007, she was reporting nonstop on the famous Katif girl case, the case of a teenage Saudi girl who was gang raped by seven men and then, when she told the authorities, sentenced to 200 lashes for being alone with a man who was not a relative. Uh, and term in prison. I'm sorry. And term in prison. And a term in prison, <laughs> in addition to the 200 lashes. Uh, Ebti Hal's reporting played a critical role in bringing the case to the attention of the international community, eventually leading to a pardon uh, for the Katif girl from King Abdullah. Ebti Hal is now based in Brooklyn and she's currently an intern at The Nation magazine. Um, lately she told me she's been spending a lot of time thinking about what Saudi Arabia should be called after the revolution when it's no longer <laughs> being run <laughs> by the Al Saud family. So you can, you can talk to her about that after the panel. She has some very interesting ideas. Um, okay, well I'd like to start out um, actually, um, Isabel, by asking you about your recent piece for uh, foreign policy, Is the Arab Spring Bad for Women? Um, and you write about this uh, paradoxical fact that dictatorships are often a good thing for women and, and that um, in spite of the fact that women's activism was very important in bringing about these Arab revolts, that women may be unlikely to turn this into any longer term gains. And could you describe um, you know, well, your research? To, to be clear, I've actually, I, I've never written that dictatorships are good for women. I think dictatorships are bad for people, men and women. Um, but there is this paradoxical effect that under dictatorships, some autocratic, secular dictatorships, they have pushed an agenda of women's rights. So that has been the case in countries like Tunisia and to some extent Egypt. Uh, so there ha they've passed laws uh, that uh, have been uh, relatively uh, progressive for women, have expanded rights for women. And uh, now that those regimes have been uh, swept away and there are new regimes in place and there's democracy in place, uh, the, the reality is that it's a much more turbulent, uh, unclear political environment and women are going to have to navigate it. And they're going to have to uh, work and fight for their rights in this new dynamic political environment that's very fluid. Uh, and they're going to have to articulate uh, reasons and justifications for those rights it won't be just top down anymore. And you already see in countries like Egypt and to some extent Tunisia, there are conservative voices that are arguing against women's rights and a rollback of women's rights and that's a reality and women are going to have to uh, understand that political dynamic and, and uh, work within it uh, mm -hmm. effectively. Mm -hmm. Mona, I'm curious as to what you, how, how you see um, you know, the outlook looking forward. Right. 
I think a big struggle, first of all, I, wasn't, I didn't just have my arms broken by Egyptian right police, I was also, also sexually assaulted. And it's really important to say that because part of our struggle is to break the silence and the shame that they try to put on us. And it's not just me, at least 100 women in Egypt have been sexually assaulted by the army, by soldiers, by the police since Hosni Mubarak was forced to step down. Now obviously sexual assault and sexual violence against women are not exclusive to Egypt, they're not exclusive to Arab men, they're not exclusive to the Muslim world. They're recognized as a weapon of war globally. Having said that, and the reason that I stress that is that this is part of our struggle, this is part of the revolution. I mean, as, as uh, Catherine mentioned, uh, Ibtihal's incredible work on helping Katif girl. I mean, this, th that kind of sexual violence and having women pay the price for it and having women basically shut up is at the heart of our revolution. Isabel makes uh, an important point. In Egypt, a lot of the feminists that, that I work with, that I admire and, and whose work I love to support have had to struggle against this idea that they support Mama Suzanne, which is Suzanne Mubarak. Because historically, we've had all these first ladies who, are, who seem to champion women's rights because that's about the only thing they can do that, that seems to be good other than being married to this asshole who is suffocating our country. It's, it's safe ground. It, it, it is, because who can stand up to you when you're, when you're defending women's rights? And it also helps you with your Western allies. Mm -hmm. Because when you have five US presidents supporting Hosni Mubarak, and Hosni Mubarak's wife, just like Sadat's wife, and just like all the other assholes' wives, can step up and say, but we support women's rights, how can you possibly stand up against that? You know, you, you gain a lot of ground by saying, I'm good for women, because if, if I go, look who's waiting in the wing, it's these crazy, scary Muslim men with big beards who are going to roll back all these rights. And so where I position myself, and where everybody involved in the revolution I know positions themselves, is they position themselves very clearly in the middle. They tell the asshole to go away and they tell the scary Muslim men who even think for a second that they're going to deny us our rights or silence us or shame us to go away because this revolution is ultimately about freedom and dignity. And that freedom and dignity is for men and women. And how women, how Egyptian women are going to fight it is, there's a whole host of examples that, that I hope we'll talk about, but I just want to keep it to, to, to the points that I just made that it cannot be seen as the property or, or and these, these men and their wives, the first ladies and the dictators, cannot co-opt feminism and pretend they're rescuing women because they're not. Because if you're, it, it, just as you said, dictators are bad for everybody, men and women. And I don't want my, my rights to come from a dictator and his wife. I want my rights to come because I demanded my rights. I, just, I would just add quickly that the, the laws that protect women's rights in Egypt are being contested now from the, uh, the scary Muslim, the men, scary with Muslim men with beards, but they're also being contested from you know, traditionally so-called liberal parties who look at the laws and say they're Suzanne's laws. This That's is the Mubarak. problem. Yeah. And they call them Suzanne's laws as a way to discredit them. I mean, they're really being attacked from all sides. Ebti <coughs> um, Hal, um, I know that up till now the protests in Saudi Arabia have been uh, fairly limited. But there, um, I, I wonder if you could, I know you've been living here, but I wonder if you could describe how they're being, um, how, how Saudis are, are uh, viewing the protests in the mm -hmm. rest of the Arab world. I'd like to also um, comment on the uh, former question and agree with Mona that the idea of uh, benevolent dictatorship, like Ben Ali and uh, Mubarak, it's only cynical that they use women was to uh, promote themselves in the West. Because if you think about it, giving a woman, women's rights is not, does not really, lo you, don't, you don't lose your power. You're not giving them the freedom of expression. And if a woman is active politically, I'm, she will be treated even, I think, harsher than the men, the treatment and the, uh, for her. So, but compared to Saudi Arabia, uh, that is not there because the Saudi uh, royal family uh, drives its legit legitimacy from the religious establishment. Mm -hmm. So that's just to, to make uh, the comparison. But as you may all know that uh, women rights in, the, in Saudi Arabia is strictly, or um, every time you speak about it, you only hear about women driving, which is something that Saudi women think they took it as a symbol for, for women who are treated uh, under Saudi law as perpetual minors. You always have to have your male legal guardianship in every single basic Monday decision in, in your life. So uh, challenging the, the ban uh, on driving is, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a symbol for the absence of all uh, control over your life. You're always in the back seat. So that this, just to just bring the history of it, it started 
in the 90s. It's been two decades now. As you can see, nothing really much happened, and that's how that only tells you how repressive is the the, the Saudi uh, government. I would love to call it regime. Uh, the Saudi regime is concerning women's rights and any rights mm -hmm. as well. Uh, in the demonstrations uh, uh, this year, have been uh, a couple of demonstrations, actually hundreds of them. Male, uh, a lot of them were uh, strictly by women uh, who were calling not actually uh, for uh, to lift the ban on driving, but the demonstrations are were strictly political uh, for uh, demonstrating the long-term uh, detainees. There, there, there are. A human rights group in Saudi estimates a number of 30,000 political prisoners in the country without trial. So those were women, like the last demonstration here was uh, December 12, 100 women and a dozen men were demonstrating after the Friday uh, prayers in Riyadh and in Bereda. Uh, Bereda is the most conservative uh, Qasim, Qasim uh, region, the most conservative in the country, and demanding the release of their husbands and uh, brothers and uh, you know, sons. There was a woman filmed on YouTube. She's a, she's a grandmother. She's a uh, illiterate 70 year old woman from a small village in the south of Saudi Arabia. She went to visit her two sons in prison in Riyadh while she was waiting in the detention room. This is in the prison. While she was waiting there, uh, security forces stormed in, all masked. They all beat her until they, they broke her bones. And for such a woman to come out and speak about it publicly, and you know, you know, uh, although she's you know covered, she's on the uh, in the hospital on bed, and uh, that says something about woman you know involvement. But to go back to uh, the woman driving, uh, there is uh, it's been started in the 90s, and there we have petitions, and you have a couple of women going you know there, uh, I mean individually driving their cars. But the I think the most optimistic thing that happened in the country, the driving campaign that started uh, the call for the woman, like, I will drive my car campaign. It started on Facebook on uh, June uh, 17th. And it was a collaborative work of women. The face for that campaign was uh, this 32-years-old uh, uh, commuter consultant woman. She works at the, the Aramco company in the Eastern Province, single mother called Manal Sharif. She's not the only one, but she was the face of the campaign because she was her circumstances and her family, the single woman, allowed her that, you know, to come forward and, and reveal her, her herself. So she filmed this uh, YouTube and uh, she filmed herself uh, asking women to join her, saying, telling them, you know, just comforting, this is, we're not demonstrating, we're merely driving our cars, there's no certain law that restricts women from driving. And it was, it was a hit, it, it went viral over the net and in Saudi Arabia. You were describing to me how there was something about Manal, this like ordinary, middle, very middle class she woman. She is a she's middle not, class, yeah. She's not an activist, she's not she's well not, I was surprised when I heard about her name because um, I know every, I think I know all women <laughs> activists in the country. She was never involved. It gives you a sense of how many there are. <laughs> She was never really involved. How many they are? You know why they're, we think they're limited? Because there's no mean of communicating between each other. Because the country, we don't have, there are no parties, there are unions, there are no even clubs at the universities. I discovered, I met Manal recently in New York City. Uh, where she was eager to rent a car, where, you said. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I discovered that at, in my freshman year at college, we were the same college. I was a science major, she was a science major, and she's like, You've never been to the basketball team? Like, no, I was in the library. But, I mean, we have different yeah. interests back then. But, I mean, we were at the same school, the same college. We had the same, you know, uh, same thoughts, same feelings towards certain things. And we, we could never meet. So how little they are, I don't think they are little. I think they lack the mean of connecting to each other. You can, living, you can be living in the same city, same neighborhood. You don't know that your next door neighbor shares your same, uh, same views. But back to Manal. Manal was the, is, I told her, like, I mean, I'm in love with her. because like, she's the perfect example. Like, she's the ideal face for the campaign. Because in, the in 99, when 47 women drove their cars publicly in, the, in Riyadh during the Gulf War, they were mainly academics, they were doctors, they were upper middle class women. A lot of them, if not most of them, uh, all of them studied in the West. Manal is not like that. She's a middle class woman. She went to public schools. She went to public university. Um, uh, she's, you know, she's never, she's not, she's not, a, she doesn't uh, classify herself as a liberal nor a conservative. She thinks she's a, you know, she's a moderate 
Muslim, and the only time she studied in the West was when she's uh, she went to the work uh, exchange program from her, you know, from a company, Aramco. from a okay. company, and she is actually the most courageous <coughs> until now. She's the most courageous. Before that, uh, the first woman who drove her car publicly, or she, she said, I mean, she, she drove her car uh, recently was with Jihad Hawader, whom I shared on, uh, in writing a petition to the king in 2007, asking him to uh, grant us the right to drive. Well, Jihad drove her car in the suburbs. Manal drove her car in the middle of the city. She just drove her car there. And she's like, she's telling the jihad, she's like, with jihad, no, let, 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 let us, let not this, uh, the government off or the people, let's just drive, you know, on the highway or the suburbs. And like, she's like, what are you talking about? No, I'm driving my car to go to the supermarket, to drive my kid to the hospital, to go to, you know, pick him from the school and, and, and so on. So she's just, she because in the 1990, when those women drove their cars, they were, defamed for two years, nonstop, in every Friday cer ceremony prayer, in uh, mosque <coughs> gatherings. They were defamed. They were called, among many uh, names, prostitutes, American secularists, and communists. I don't know, how can you be American secularist and a communist? I mean, <laughs> at the same time. But and Zionists, yeah. and CIA spies. And CIA spies, exactly. So they were defamed them because they've been educated in the West, or they have a Western agenda. But in Manal's case, that doesn't happen. So even the government, I mean, they're like, they're trying so hard to, to just pick on something, but they really can't. And they were like, you know, of course, other than that, it's a Shia too, because the majority are uh, Sunnis. So that's another Do you thing. see Manal as, uh, in a way, a product of the Arab Spring? I know you were, you were saying when we spoke earlier that you felt that um, it's become possible for ordinary Saudis, middle-class Saudis, people who are not well-connected or especially well-educated to consider themselves activists. Or yes, she, she told me she was very much inspired by the Arab Spring. She was very inspired by the um, video uh, by the Egyptian blogger Asma Mahfouz, mm -hmm. who did that video uh, blog and asked, encouraged people to join her in demonstrating before January 25th even. So she told me, I mean, everyone, she's like, if they can do it. She thought that's the right time to do it, that, that will be the right time. Okay. I, okay. I think one of the other things that was so interesting about the Women to Drive campaign is, as you said, that earlier genera generation of women was, was hounded by the government. Their, their reputations were you know, really in tatters. But this time around, you had these ordinary women who were driving, and they posted videos of themselves on YouTube. Driving along, you could see them. They were, many of them were veiled. They had their husbands or their brothers or their fathers sitting next to them. They were so incredibly ordinary. Right. They they weren't they clearly weren't Zionist spies. You know, they clearly weren't they clearly weren't agents of the CIA. They were your next door neighbor. And the government was unable to control the narrative. They were unable to, yes, control the narrative. They were unable to spread ru rumors. I mean, it's, it's just, it was impossible for them. That's why they detained them briefly. They only uh, imprisoned Manal for nine days because she, they thought, in the, I mean, it was stated in the newspapers, she incited the movement. She incited yeah. uh, disobedience. That you was know, her charges. Your question earlier about the dictator and his wife and where the women's rights come from, are they top down or not? The Saudi case is very interesting because the, the current king, King Abdullah, is often portrayed as a reformer who wants to give women rights. But then on the other side, and then we're always told that there's this liberal wing in the Saudi royal family and they want to give people more rights, but there's this group of conservatives who are just going to go nuts. So they have, to, they have to reform really slowly because the people are not ready. This is an incredibly offensive idea that the people are not ready because one, one of the, the things that this Women to Drive campaign did and very cleverly did was that they would post these videos but they'd also write about it on social media and, and create a discussion and a fuss over this idea that the people are not ready because they would often say, look, I've just come back home and I've just driven my car. And, and all these men next to me on the street saw me driving my car and they were just fine and some of them gave me a thumbs Cheering, up. Yeah. But it was the police who stopped me. So who's not ready? It's the authorities who are not ready, not the people. So this idea, again, that we have to get rights from up there because our, dicta our benign dictators are so much more progressive than we are is incredibly offensive. And this is why the fact that these revolutions and uprisings are happening from a grassroots level, don't have leaders, are happening 
and you see conservatives and liberals all together on the streets is, is taking away this power of the idea that the people are not ready. Because this is, this is how the Saudi royal family also justify their existence to their Western allies. Because they say, you know, because how does the US support a country like Saudi Arabia that is like a black hole when it comes to human rights? And we can sit here and talk about oil and all this stuff, you know, till the end of the day. But, you know, Saudi Arabia also gains a lot of legitimacy because of Islam and the holy sites. And among the Muslim world, it's very difficult to criticize Saudi Arabia. But they also push this agenda of the people are not ready. The people are really, really conservative. And if we just let go just a bit, it's all going to fall apart. But you have these activists who are saying it's not about the people, it's about you. And continuously, in fact, Mentalizing us and making us seem like the women are constant perpetual minors, but they also look at the society as you know, you're, you're like savage and backward. We know what we're doing, and we can only just give you kind of you know, drip drops of rights, which is very offensive mm -hmm. to the courage of the people who are, who are trying to bring about change in that country. Yeah, and to uh, add to this, like recently, when the Women to Drive campaign is getting more popular and getting very much uh, support in among the status society, men and women, the Shura Council, which every I mean, it's a Everyone is appointed member by the consulted, king, yeah. consulted, yes. Invited this guy to give, I'm sure they, I mean, they had a show, the thing about it at uh, SNL, that this guy came up with the research that women driving can, you can lose your virginity. Oh, I saw this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and this is, this is not random. Why would the Shura Council invite such a guy to speak? To, this is not random. They, these are two things. One. They're giving a message to the women activists that we will let the, the most crazy, absurd folks in the right wing to come and, you know, be on your case. We're going to make them harass you. We're going to give them the green light to harass you. One. Two, this is also for the West. And like, look, there's a small group of women who wants to drive, but look how what we deal with in a daily basis. Crazy look people. at those savages. Look at those, you know, this, are, you're gonna put, that, this is what you're going to deal with. It reminds me a little bit of... Uh, uh, Christian Amambour uh, interview with Omar Suleiman, America's favorite guy in Egypt, who ran their interrogation uh, program, the redemption, redemption program. Rendition. Now that redemption program, Rendition. now that uh, Guantanamo Bay uh, detention camp is upon us, the tenth anniversary tomorrow. So when he was with her, she was like, he was like, I don't know how many times did he mention not the Muslim Brotherhood, Brotherhood Muslims. Brother Muslim Hood. Bro brother Muslim brother Hood. Muslim hood. <laughs> yes. It's very popular in Egypt now, Brother yes, Muslim Hood. I love that, yes. So, Fear I them. mean, that's like, that, that shows you, I mean, the, yeah. how much, you know, the resemblance is just, you know. But one of the, one of the interesting things um, has been, I think, a lot of the men who have supported women and women's right to drive. I mean, you've had some crazies in the Shura Council, but you've also had members of the Shura Council stand up and say, why can't women drive? Yep. That was, and yeah. by the way, Look at the economic cost it imposes on our country, that we have to import up to a million drivers to come and drive our women around, and they, and they repatriate $4 billion a year. You had a member of the Shura Council yeah. stand up in 2007 and put it in economic terms. Now, with oil at over $100 a barrel, the economic <coughs> urgency is not there. But this is an economic urgency. There is an issue. economic urgency. There is an economic urgency because the majority are middle class and they don't have their jobless, the women. And they, they, I mean, you can get employed right now out of uh, college with like 700 a month being a woman. Half of that goes to your driver, yeah. if, not even, uh -huh. if not even more. But, the, but across the board, this is an economic issue. We've got the driving issue and the fact that you have to import labor to drive women around. But also in Saudi, one of the big controversies has been, you know, there's very high unemployment, as we all know. Very, very high unemployment among women. And women have to, when they go into a shop to buy lingerie, you would think in this conservative society that they would buy lingerie from other women. Well, no. <laughs> they don't want women working in lingerie shops, so they buy lingerie from men. This has been a very controversial thing. Are women allowed to work as clerks in stores? Are they allowed to work as in the checkout line at supermarkets? Or well, as household help, housekeepers and so on. There's been a... Well, a there's a lot of domestic out. help who's imported mm -hmm. for that. But, the, but there was a, a Panda Supermarkets had a whole program to employ women as uh, clerks in, in supermarkets at the checkout line. No, said no. It is. This is a very core economic issue uh, for all of these countries. 
I think that and, and the alliance between men and women is a very important one across the board, not just in Saudi. I mean, yeah, and El Sharif had her father and her brother's support, and so many other women who were breaking the ban on driving had their their male relative support too. But when you look at you, when you look at Egypt, and what's happening in Egypt and Tunisia, Tunisia and other countries? I mean, there was a story in the New York Times today that drove me absolutely nuts, and I was telling Catherine about this because you know, on 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 its surface, the story seems to be good, which is that. He, we, they, they, they feature a young woman called Samira Ibrahim who was subjected along with 17 other activists to so-called virginity tests by, the, by Egyptian soldiers in March of last year. So these so-called virginity tests are basically sexual assaults that the military used because they claimed that they wanted to ensure that these female activists that detained were virgins so that they didn't accuse the military of raping them while in detention as if only virgins could be raped. So then this story, I mean, we could have a panel alone on these so-called virginity tests, but Two of the women spoke out. One of them gave an interview from the very beginning and was chastised across the board and called a liar by everybody because the military denied it had happened at the time. It was a very sensitive time for Egypt because the military was still portraying itself as the safeguards of the revolution. But a young woman called Salwa Hosseini spoke out and broke that taboo of speaking out about speaking about, about the military. Samira Ibrahim, who was featured in the New York Times story today, has actually raised, is, is suing the military. There's, there's this woman from a very conservative part of Egypt who was suing the military and standing up and saying, you can't do this to me. And the reason the other woman isn't is because she doesn't have ID, identification papers and you need ID to, to, to raise a lawsuit in Egypt. But what really, really enraged me about this story in the New York Times is that it said, you know, it gave all these statistics about women and sexual assault that I quoted 100 women being sexually assaulted. It quoted one of my favorite feminists in Egypt, a woman called Mosna Hassan, who's the executive director of a feminist movement called Nazra, which means vision. And she's fantastic. And she was saying, you know, we don't want men to be the only guarantors of our safety and security on the streets. Because if we have to wait for men to protect us against the sexual violence and the physical violence of the army, it will mean that men will set basically the guidelines for us. It will be, I will protect you as long as you do this. I will protect you as long as you behave in that way. So here's an Egyptian feminist saying this, and she's saying it clearly and openly. And she's encouraging other Egyptian women to go out there and protect ourselves. And yet the story says that Egyptian women, and, and they, they mentioned that woman who was dragged across to Hagia Square and stripped down to her bra. And if anybody calls a blue bra girl, I swear I will kick you where it hurts. Because she's not a blue bra girl, she's a woman. And she must not be reduced to the color of her underwear. But anyway, so they use this woman and they say, Egyptian women, basically female revolutionaries, are mostly silent victims who risk becoming these icons of the male-dominated uprising. And that enrages me. Where is the silence? Where is the silence when you hear women like Ebtehal and myself? Where is the silence when Mosna Hassan is telling the New York Times, we will not wait for Egyptian men to protect us? Where is the silence? And so it looks like the New York Times is doing us a favor by showing us, look, here is some, we're writing about women now. They never interview women when it comes to political stories in the Middle East. I mean, obviously everything is political, but when it comes to, you know, they never pick up a phone and, and speak to female experts about what's happening in the region. But the one time when they focus on women is women as victims. So look at, look at the irony here. We're talking about men and women on the ground fighting together, and yet the New York Times is portraying women only in, in, in this context of being victims, but yet they have, they have these feminists and these women who are standing up to the military. A 26-year-old Egyptian is suing the military, and the New York Times is telling me that Egyptian women risk falling, risk becoming silent, or are mostly silent victims of a revolution and icons of these men. It enrages me. So you've got to ask, how you look at women in that part of the world. What, what is the lens through which you look at women in that part of the world? Because they have far outstripped you. They're not waiting for you to look at them in the diversity that they, that they come under. Because as Isabel mentioned and Ibtahal mentioned, there are men and women and, and the support goes across both camps. So I think part of trying to understand what's happening in the region with these uprisings and revolutions is understanding that for too long, you have looked at that part of the world through a very narrow lens that portrays women there as victims, that portrays Muslims there as barbarians, that portrays the dictators there as you know, these benign men who give, you know, all of these givens that, are, that have very surely been dismantled by the various uprisings that you're seeing, because that's the least you can do to honor the courage of the people there. I know I'm biased on this subject because I, I wrote a whole book about how women are transforming the Middle East, uh, which really echoes what Mona is saying. And uh, just two things. One is you mentioned uh, the women in Saudi. 
these conservative Abaya clad women who are out there demonstrating about these 30,000 people who've disappeared. Their husbands, their brothers, their sons. And they won't go away, which is interesting. And if you look at what sparked, what was the spark that got the Libyan revolution going? It was women doing the exact same thing, demonstrating at the prison against the fact that their loved ones, their, their brothers, their husbands, their fathers had disappeared. And they would not go away. And there was violence against them that sparked more violence, and the revolution started. And if you think of that as women as victims, I mean, these are women as change agents. I was in Libya in January. I mean, Libya, I'm sorry. I was in Yemen in January. And I went and spent a day with Tawakul Karman unknown at the time to I, probably everybody in this room, who uh, was a remarkable young woman who was leading protests. Every Friday prayer. I For mean, two years. Every mm -hmm. Friday. After every Friday, she had women without chains, and they will demonstrate the freedom of expression in Yemen. They were like 5, 10, 20, every Friday, no matter how many little women. And you see them were all wearing their niqab, and you know. She wore the niqab up until uh, recently. And she said to me, I said, why did you take your niqab off? And she said, well, it's really hard to be a revolutionary wearing a niqab. <laughs> 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 of course, she wears the headscarf, but not covers her face anymore, which I really, I, I, I love that line. <laughs> but she, when I was, when I spent the day with her, she was out in front of Sana University, and there were maybe a couple hundred people with her. Maybe, a couple hundred. And later in the week, I mean, this was in January, every day there were more and more people. And she had been there with 10 people, 30 people, 20 people for two years. But these are very courageous, determined people who are really pushing for change, pushing for change in all sorts of ways. They're pushing for economic change. They're pushing for political change. They're pushing for cultural change. They're pushing for religious change. You know, it's, to me, I'm, I'm in awe. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the women as well don't just identify in terms of just feminist issues. I mean, for me, gender trumps everything. So I identify primarily as a feminist. But there are a lot of women in Egypt who are working on the ground, who are working on issues that are not specifically, that are not gender specific. So there's a, a young woman, for example, called Mona Saif. And she has been spearheading the No to Military Trials campaign. She's a 24-year-old uh, biology researcher. And you know, alongside her genetic studies that every now and then she complains about on Twitter, this woman has basically garnered uh, this huge support across the country to end military trials of Egypt because at least 12,000 people have gone before military tribunals, including her brother. But she started this campaign months before her brother. Now, if you spoke to Mona, she would not necessarily say, I identify primarily as a feminist as I would, but she's out there, a strong, kick-ass Egyptian woman standing up to the military. And there are so many female attorneys who have been out there defending the most unpopular people. We have the first political blogger who was imprisoned in Egypt. He's a young man called Michael Nabil. He's an atheist, he supports Israel, and he's against the army. You can't get worse than that in Egypt. That is like the end. It's the Bermuda Triangle. And this guy was imprisoned way, he was in, in March, and he was the first to warn about the military basically not being say, the safeguards of the revolution. And Mona and others have been defending him, and so many uh, lawyers out there defending the most unpopular cases, saying this is a, prin a point of principle. This is about freedom of expression, and this is about the freedom and dignity that's at the heart of the revolution. So, so you know, you see these women, and, and they lead marches, and they're out in the courts, and they're standing up to military tribunals, you know, the, the, the complete opposite of victimhood. They, they are survivors. If they do experience violence, as I do and Samira do, Samira did, then we're survivors of the military. We're not victims of the military. The language here is very important. Back to Tawakkul Kurman. I met Tawakkul in Kuwait 2007, mm -hmm. and we had, she was with the band and with another Yemeni journalist who was a former editor in chief, and he was, you know, um, sacked out of his job. When, he, when they went back to Yemen, he was actually detained, and she held me right to peace. She went there, and she's like, okay, I'll, like, I'll let you talk to him. I'm going in prison in like an hour. And then when I, had, I, I was able to talk to him, she smuggled the cell phone, in her, uh, the cell phone to him in the, in the uh, prison. I mean, before that, she was all for freedom of uh, the press, as you said, for different topics. She was not restricted to only uh, women issues. Well, one thing that surprised me when I was in Egypt at the end of September was that so many of the young female activists that I met were actually very uncomfortable with the term feminist and, and seemed to resist it. Um, 
How do you read that, Mona? Do you feel mm -hmm. that uh, there's a sense that this is just not the time, that we have too much else to fight for, or no, I, is it a generational thing? Or I think it, the same would happen if we asked a lot of people in this room, are you a feminist or not? I, I constantly get this when I give public talks about women's rights or women's issues, and there's always this, so do I identify as a feminist? Must I identify with the F word? I don't think this is specific <laughs> to Egypt. When I was, I was in Egypt in July during the, the sitting that was happening in Tahrir Square and Nazra for feminist studies, this feminist movement that I mentioned, one of my friends is leading, is a feminist movement that was launched by men and women. And ironically enough, this New York Times story that I'm obsessed with right now used, used it as, as an example of how it's the men who are out there helping to rescue the women. I think it's a positive thing that a feminist movement was launched seven years ago in Egypt, seven years ago, by men and women, because it's a clear understanding that in order to get women's issues, and not just women's issues, because they also focus on LGBT rights, they focus on masculinity studies, they talk about gender issues. It's important to have men and women and all the various other identities that people use to describe themselves to work together on this. And so Nazra hosted me for a discussion and, and it brought together a lot of the community that they work with, not just people in Nazra itself. And we had a, a very robust discussion about feminism and who identifies as a feminist and what happened when women and men tried to hold a march in Egypt to coincide with International Women's Day last year and it was a disaster. And women were assaulted and women were threatened with rape and it was, it was a really, really bad time. That day was very depressing for everybody. And the kind of discussions that came out were incredibly deep and were incredibly understanding excuse my voice, I'm, I'm fighting a cold, incredibly understanding of the kind of issues and that, that Egyptian men and women have to navigate because they had a whole team, for example, working in, in, across Egypt, north, south, east, west, with female candidates who wanted to run for president, I mean, for, for the parliament. And one of them was a Christian woman. And to understand the kind of the multiple layers of challenges that this Christian woman is facing to run for parliament in Egypt. She's running as a woman, she's running as a Christian, she's running as someone from, from the countryside, a very conservative part of Egypt. It, it's a very, very in-depth discussion that, that isn't just about, am I a, a feminist? Mm -hmm. That's why I mentioned Mona Saif, because for me, it's not so important that she identifies as a feminist. It's, I, I don't want to impose on her a label that for me is the center of my identity, because what she's doing by being a 24-year-old Egyptian, who is also a woman, but is going out there in the public field and standing up to the military or running for parliament in, in the very conservative parts of southern Egypt, as this other woman does, what she's doing is she is normalizing the idea that a woman is this gender mainstreaming. You know, you have all these this jargon that people use that really means nothing unless you see women actually on the street doing it. What is gender mainstreaming? It means that to be able to look and see women and men and all the other labels that we use doing everything and look at it as a normal thing. And so when you see Mona Safe out there in Tahrir Square and she's going out to taxi drivers who might not necessarily support the revolution and gives them a sticker that says no to military trials and persuades them to put it in their cab so that the next time someone comes into their cab they see this sticker for no to military trials, that for me is the ultimate feminist act because it's a woman who's gone out, gone out into the public sphere, has created a space for herself in a public sphere and has said, I am going to change what I don't like in this public sphere. That for me is feminism. If she goes around calling herself a feminist or not, that's not my prerogative, that's her prerogative. But so you sit around a table with these young men and women and, and also there were those who were, discuss, who were in charge of their masculinity project. Now to sit there and listen to Egyptian men and women talk about masculinity and the pressures on, on Egyptian men and what it means to be masculine. Just as I fight the pressures of what it means to be feminine and I get to define my femininity when I want it and when I don't, it is also part of that struggle is for an Egyptian man to determine what it means to be masculine. What does it mean to be a man? Because a lot of the pressure in Egypt today and something that, that is disturbing me is when the police broke my arms, when I was sexually assaulted, when this woman was dragged through Tahrir, a lot of men would write to me and say, I can't look you in the eye. I can't believe they did this to you and I wasn't there to save you. What kind of men are we that we allowed them to do this to you? We have to fight this head on. It's not, it's not about a man and another man fighting over my body to ensure that I'm okay. This, this is the last thing that we want and this is why these women who are going out in the public sphere are so important. And that's why these ideas of what, what is masculinity? Are you just a man because you've come and rescued my honor? 
which has been ruined by the sexual assault? No, because my honor is not ruined by the sexual assault. The shame belongs to the man who sexually assaulted me. And you as a man, your masculinity is not derived from saving my honor. All these kind of discussions are happening in Egypt every day. And so again, that, that for me is the heart of feminism. Whether they identify as feminist or not, it's not about a word. It's about taking the concept of that word and living it. And Egyptians are living it, whether they're in Suez, whether they're in southern Egypt, whether they're in a desert oasis, watching men and women together fight against military dictatorship, as they did against Mubarak, that for me is feminism in motion. Um, I'd actually love to open up to questions uh, from the audience. Um, I think there's a microphone uh, to be passed. Here. Andrea. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I have more questions than I can. I mean, if, if we falter, I'll ask some more, because I have a lot. Um, but I guess the first one I wanted to ask, um, virginity testing is really vague language to me and uh, it reminds me when I first went for a mammogram and I thought you just went and turned your back to the camera because that's all I'd ever seen of a mammogram and I was like oh crap and they left a lot out or worse case um, uh, what did they call it um, female circumcision you know a complete misnomer so could I ask just I'd like to have better language better a better concept better description for You want to know what it is? What it is, yeah. Oh, I what tell you, it? I'll tell you and excuse my being graphic, it's basically a, a, a man who stuck two fingers up the woman's vaginal opening to see if there was a hymen there or not. It's sexual assault. Well, there are two ways of testing it. I actually did a little bit of research on this a uh, few months ago, and, and there's, there's what they call the two finger test, which is actually apparently for like vaginal laxity. Um, they call it, uh, this is the, the idea is that a, a uh, a woman who is not a virgin will will just be like, oh well, you know, like, <laughs> okay. you know, and, and uh, a, a woman who is a virgin will will, will go out, will tighten up or whatever, and and then there's the, there's the, the visual test for the the hymen, um, and the the two finger test tends to be the one that's favored in Egypt, uh, but uh, but anyway, they're all they're all <laughs> stunning. I'm so glad we're yes. learning this. Yeah. Yes. It's sexual assault, rape, yeah. violation, Basically. everything else. Yeah. Um. I was just interested in asking you to talk a little bit about um, Islam, you know, dealing with women's rights as a Muslim, making the mixture sort of work. Um, I think there are many progressive Islam can be interpreted in 1,100 ways, and they're very much progressive interpretations of Islam. And for uh, people, uh, feminists who uh, want to uh, uh, pursue, I mean, want to explain the right through an Islamic uh, agenda, that is very doable. I've seen a lot of people, a lot of women actually in Saudi Arabia who are secularists and, and liberals who don't, who would rather have civil rights, they would use that very progressive interpretation of Islam in, uh, in public debates. So, uh, I mean, it, it's a, it, it can be used in any way, in religion. You can interpret it in different ways. I, mean, I, met my, yeah. I, I belong to a movement called Musawa, which is the Arabic word for equality. This movement was launched in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia in 2009, and it's basically an umbrella that brings together both secular feminists and Islamic feminists. Now, I used to identify as a Muslim feminist when I was much younger and I was more conservative. I used to wear a headscarf and despite the fact that I wore a headscarf or maybe because I wore a headscarf at the time I was quite different. There was no, there was no contradiction between wearing a headscarf and being a feminist because for me it was determining what of my body I wanted to show. I am no longer that woman, I don't wear a headscarf anymore, and I no longer identify as a Muslim feminist. I identify as a Muslim and as a feminist. I keep my Islam and my feminism separate because while I recognize that there is a need for some people to, to use Islam and to use reinterpretations of Islam to fight for women's rights, I'm very wary of doing my verse versus your verse. Now, there are many, many Muslims across the world who will not reconsider something unless you give them the verse from the Quran or the saying of the, the, of the Prophet that gives them permission to reconsider that. But there are other Muslims such as myself who are not waiting for that permission. And that's what Musawa does. What Musawa does is it's brought together men and women who identify as Muslim, but some of whom identify as secular 
feminist Muslims and some who identify as Islamic feminists. And it's created an umbrella. And what it does is it, it allows, it has given us the tools because th th there's now publications and there are scholars involved with this movement and they take their education around the world. It's given us the tools to, to give whoever we come across what they want to hear when, when they have questions like child marriage, female genital mutilation, polygamy, you know, all the really problematic issues of, of women's rights and, and gender issues that come up today. So, for example, they'll, they'll help you make an argument whether you want to use um, universal declarations of human rights that various countries have signed on to, or the various interpretations, be they progressive or conservative, of uh, certain Quranic verses and, and the, the, the Prophet sayings. So what I'm saying to you is, yes, there, there is a recognized branch now called Islamic feminism, and it actually uses scripture, and it uses various ways, of, you know, jurisprudence and, and, and all the, the different progressive attempts to reinterpret the religion, but there's also a very definite and recognized form of secular feminism, feminism as well. And I think that, you know, that is not unique to Islam. When you look at Jewish feminists, when you look at Christian feminists, whether they identify as religious and secular or not, you know, it's up to them, but Islam is going through what all other religions have gone through. And uh, as long as there's room for me and there's room for the Islamic feminists, I'm happy. If they try to kick me out, that's when I begin to fight. A, while we're waiting, can I, can I just make a comment? You know, I think, Mona, what you said is so important is that there does need to be room for all different approaches. And the approach of Islamic feminists, um, it, you know, it may not appeal to some, but I actually think it's a very important approach in, in certain places in the world where Islam is the cultural touchstone. It is what people are looking for in places. To, for that permission, and it, it, it becomes a very powerful argument. And um, the book I wrote, Paradise Beneath Her Feet, looks at this movement of Islamic feminism around the world, not in theoretical terms. There is a remarkable theoretical literature, academic literature, saying how do you reconcile Islam and women's rights? And there's academics who've done that, and I think there's lots of room to do that through more progressive interpretations of Islam. But looking at how it's actually trickling down to the grassroots level, how women in Afghanistan are arguing with their husbands against child marriage using verses from the Quran, or arguing for the right for girls to go to school, or um, arguing against polygamy in Morocco and having polygamy restricted, but using actually theology against theology. And I agree with you that it is ultimately um, unsatisfactory ground to have to fight theology with theology, mm -hmm. but I think it's a very important stepping stone in many ways to get from where um, some people are in terms of very conservative traditions that are reinforced in the name of Islam. And that people don't think that there is any movement for change, when in fact there is. And a lot of women, and men by the way, have never read the Quran. They're simply told what to think and what to believe. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the, um, the, the experience today of women who are directly reading the Quran themselves with rising levels of literacy, <coughs> you, know, you have more and more women who are accessing the text themselves and saying, hey, it doesn't really say that. Or it, or it says it here, but it says something very different over here. And beginning to contextualize and to argue and to fight back on some very conservative interpretations that leave them as second-class citizens or worse in their own families, in their own societies. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in the role of women in Iran, uh, both under the current regime and in the democracy movement, and how might it compare, for example, to the situation in um, Saudi Arabia? Well, that's a good question. Um, one of my friends posted the other day something on Facebook. There was, uh, I think, uh, uh, was it the Boston Globe or something? They had pictures from Iran, women in Iran, and on the daily r routine. And she's like, I wish I was an Iranian woman. I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Iranian women compared to Saudi have so much rights, so much better. They have, I mean, it's, I mean, you can't even compare. Iranian women are. They, I mean, they're like judges now, they're uh, taxi, yeah, drivers. taxi drivers, <laughs> they're sharing the public life, they're in the political uh, sphere, they're uh, lawyers. You can't, you can't begin to compare them with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the most repressive I and mean, the worst place for a woman to 
born and raised in Saudi Arabia, unless compared to with like to say a war zone where they have like gang graves and you know. But compared to Iran, Iran is pretty much progressive for women's rights than Saudi Arabia on, on, on so many different uh, levels, yeah. But it's still a, it's still a dictatorship. It's still, it's still a dictatorship, but I'm saying compared to Saudi Arabia, and, yeah. and they, they yeah. have much and more uh, room to practice. And the, the women law. have, um, you know, they, they had their rights in many respects stripped away with the Islamic Revolution sure. and have clawed their way back legally in many senses, uh, you know, it, not fully. Um, but for example, the marriage age in Iran legally mm -hmm. is 13. Mm -hmm. But the average age of a marriage in Iran is 26. And in fact, I think it's even it's higher, higher today. Here, maybe. It's, it is higher than yeah. here, absolutely. The marriage age in Saudi Arabia, there's no marriage age. You can marry someone who's like nine, nine. or 10. There's no, even, and, you know. And they yeah. do. Yeah, and they do. And, and, and they, they do. do. And Whereas they do. in Iran. Child marriage is a big thing in Saudi In Iran, Arabia. child marriage is very, very rare. Uh, but le women protest le against that legal um, But then you have injustice. the legal framework. You can go and protest, and you have the legal framework. You have NGOs. You have uh, organizations. You don't have, there are no NGOs in Saudi Arabia. There are no civil rights societies in Saudi Arabia. How can you protest this? The, there's the, no way, unless you petition the king or do something stupid. Like, there's no legal frame for you uh, to uh, redeem your rights back. The, the one thing I would say, though, going back to Mona's point about these women are not victims. I mean, if you look at the green movement in Iran, I mean, today it is on life support, uh, partly because the government, uh, I mean, not partly, largely because the government has arrested them and really cracked down in a very harsh way. But the ones who really continue to persist are women. You know, it is the women who are out there. It is women lawyers defending political prisoners. It is women who continue to demonstrate. And it is women who the government fears, and they're very harsh with the women. You know, they really throw them in prison. Even Sharon Abadi, who's been a conscience of that country, and she was out of the country when the election happened and the Green Movement erupted. And she was told by friends and family members, oh, don't come back right now. And it's more than two years later, and she's not gone back to Iran. She's living here in the United States. Mm -hmm. But you know, when, when you know that Sharon Abadi can't go back, it's, it's bad for women, mm -hmm. because she's a very brave person. But if you look at who is the conscience of that country today, who continues to be out on the streets and protesting against human rights abuses, not just about women's rights, about human rights, it is largely women. There are many points to make, and this is a really great talk, but I just wanted to share uh, the experience of my country, Kuwait, uh, because you brought up um, how women are needing change in their world. In the, in the example of Kuwait, I would say that women in politics are the only righteous ones. They are the ones who advocate for uh, minorities. They are, they are the ones who stand up for the stateless or the undocumented, as they call them. They are the ones who refuse to take illegal primary elections of the tribes because they think that's um, against the law and against the unity of the country. So um, they are defending all stereotypes. And, and they're doing amazing, and we just got our rights just in like 2006. First elections, no one won. Second elections, four women won, and it was fascinating and was just unexpected. And at the same time, we can see that I saw like this radical guy who was always voting against women's rights, and he won the elections because more than 60% of the votes came from women. And there was this guy advocating openly for the women and he, w he lost because women did not vote for him majorly in the district. So it's very complicated and we, we need to raise the question of class. I mean, in, in Yemen, for example, I don't think class is an issue. Uh, we've seen women like um, like a 13-year-old girl talking about, you know, again, this child marriage and being supported and being a face in media and so on. Uh, but I, I, would, I would see, uh, for example, in Tunisia and Egypt, it's mostly driven by middle class um, women. And what they're trying to say is that, you know, um, we are taking, we are leading the political game or, or, or struggle. And it shouldn't only be focused on, on us, uh, on our rights, because this is not the stage now. It's the next stage, it's gonna, it's gonna come, it's coming at the same point. Um, another thing is that when Tawakul talked about the Nikau thing, um, I can understand what she's trying to say, 
But if Tawakkul did not wear the niqab for such a long while, she wouldn't have all this love and support from her people. Because she would, she would, they would feel she's estranged, you know, like, oh, this woman, you know, like, she, she didn't live our life, she didn't go through what we went through. But the fact that she was dressed like them and part of them get, got her with the confidence. In my country and many countries, you would see women that are not wearing niqab, but they would wear niqab when they go to the protest because they feel comfortable, they feel protected. They don't feel like, okay, I, I, my face is not revealed, so they won't take me to jail or um, my picture won't be on the newspaper, so I'll just wear the niqab and I'll go there and I'll show support. And it's as simple as this. I think we should not label anything. I, should, I think the labeling is, for our region, it's like really too complicated to label anything. It's just too hard. And, and as you go to countries like the Gulf, um, where like less, way less research is done, I mean, especially comparatively with, with Egypt. Um, we have way less research, <coughs> and like people really don't care what's happening in Kuwait, and when there's like this huge thing happening, everyone is like pretentious and like, oh yeah, we know the stuff. No, we don't know the stuff, you know? Like, it's not that, that easy. Um, but it's, it's happening. This year has been a remarkable year, I mean 2011, and it's, it's a big change, so let's hope the, for the best. Thank you. Thanks so much. I think, we have, I think we have time for oh, one more question. Uh, maybe the doll in the back there. It's me, the Nasi. Um, oh, I, didn't, I can't see your I, I was, uh, I've spent much of the last year in Egypt and I've been struck by how sexualized a lot of the discourse is, including uh, the way male activists are often demonized as khawal, as, uh, as, as gay, basically, as a way of uh, a slur to, uh, to marginalize their political demands. And I'm curious about two things. One is, 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 that, is there something different about Egypt, the level with which there's an obsession with uh, you know, women's propriety and, and, and male masculinity as, as proxies for uh, acceptability? Uh, and the second question is, how do, you, how do you prevent, or is there already a danger of the discussion of these rights uh, being sort of fatally linked to secularism. So the, the idea of treating women with respect, for example, uh, becoming uh, something that gets lumped together with secularism and, and civil control of the military as marginal issues that, that can be uh, sort of shunted aside by a polite political society. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think you ask a really important and interesting question because and it's all tied into what I was saying earlier about this, you know, these men who are writing to me saying, we wish we were there to protect you because Egypt's honor is at stake and we have to get your rights back because no one strips our girls, basically. And in, in, in it's, it's this horrible mix that has, just, has been brewing up in Egypt for years. I mean, when you look, and I love to blame the Mubarak regime for everything, for good reason. Because when you look at 2005 for me was a pivotal year. The, the Mubarak regime began to systematically target especially female activists and journalists with sexual violence. And this began in May of 2005 when a lot of activists were protesting a referendum that Mubarak was basically pushed into agreeing to, to allow multiple presidential candidates during that year. 2005 was the first year that in Egypt we had the right to choose more than one candidate rather than going to the polls and saying yes or no to just Mubarak. And so at this, this particular protest, and many of my female friends suffered from this sexual violence, this was an actual it was, it, was, it was a campaign that a general came up with, and that was either plainclothes police or thugs, hired thugs, a lot of them ex-convicts that, that work as informers for the regime, would go out and target female activists and female journalists. A lot of this was caught on camera, and these women tried to raise cases to sue the regime, but it, the, the cases were thrown out and, uh, because of lack of evidence. Now, this evidence was all documented. There were photographs and, and media. And the reason I bring this incident up is because the next year, in 2006, we had the infamous incidents in downtown Cairo, close to Tahrir Square, during a religious festival where a group of men just went on the rampage, sexually assaulting and, and groping women, dressed like me, dressed in niqab, covered from head to toe, dressed in headscarves, and police officers stood by and watched and did absolutely nothing. Now, when the state violates women, when the state thinks that it can violate women, it, it gives a green light to 
I own your body. Your body now is the property of the state. And when the state doesn't do anything, when then ordinary civilians violate women, it gives another green light, which is women, and we don't care about women. And so women's bodies do become, and that was one point that the New York Times story, I'm glad, did make, even though I don't like it. Women's bodies have become this battlefield. And when, when, it, when it, it's put in those stark terms of it's women and honor, and anyone who tries to fight for the revolution is then called gay or effeminate, as you mentioned, it's you, th this is the language of the patriarch. This is the, this is the very hyper-masculine language of the patriarch. And what we're doing in Egypt, in, and I like to quote one of my, fem my favorite feminists, who's a friend of mine, is a young woman called Fatma Imam. And she was interviewed soon after Mubarak stepped down, and her mother didn't want her to go to Tahrir Square because she considered it a very male space. She said, do you think you're a man, that you can go out there and spend night after night in Tahrir Square? And she said, I am going to Tahrir Square. And, and she said, the reason I went to Tahrir Square is because this isn't just a revolution against Mubarak. This is a revolution in every Egyptian home, not just in, in Tahrir. This is a revolution against the patriarch. So when you see the revolution and the language associated with the revolution in a language that is very patriarchal and high hyper-masculine, that's where what you're saying comes down from. Because if you're a man, then this is how you will behave. If you're a woman or effeminate, then you deserve to be treated this way. And, and it can't be just a secular, you know, hyper-masculine, patriarchal military that is going to protect me. Because clearly it's the military who thinks it owns my body. It's the military who sexually assaulted women through virginity tests. The military is the regime. So it, and, and that's why I'm glad that there are conservatives and liberals out on the street. I mean, there were Salafis also involved in the women's march that happened at the end of December. It was women and men of all different political flavors, including the ultra-conservative and the ultra-liberal. And that, I think, is the best way to, to fight this kind of language that posits people in these very, very polar opposites. The, the, the patriarch, the real man, and those opposing the patriarch who are also not real men and effeminate and women. Do you know what I mean? And so it's a struggle over language as well as political ideologies, and that struggle is happening.